Simon, I uh, really appreciated the clarity of uh, your description of your uh, philosophical perspective or interpretation of quantum physics and um, the many worlds interpretation. It, it made it easy for me to understand, you know, what you're really trying to get across, which is why I think my questions were so, uh, or you felt were so cogent, because uh, it had a lot to do with your clarity uh, and my ability to understand you because of your clarity. So um, that's good. This is good. I had a few more questions for you, though, um, because in a sense, I agree with you that if, if we're going to take uh, physics seriously, we need to come to terms with the fact that time and space, as we experience them, are, uh, uh, if not illusions, then definitely uh, distortions of what's really going on. What's really going on is not the world that our normal everyday language and thought uh, understands or, or experiences. So, for example, uh, all of space-time already exists, like you were saying. Uh, and looking at the quantum wave function from the many worlds perspective, I think, allows us to take what, what, what was an inherently uncertain uh, principle, the uncertainty principle, uh, and sort of transform it into a new way of looking at determinism. So one wave function, you can never tell which particular um, position or time that you will uh, experience within the wave function, but you know that all of them are potentialities, uh, and from the many worlds perspective, not only potentialities, but actualities. They actually exist in some dimension. Um, I guess the question would be, are there other observers in each dimension? Or is it only our dimension that has an observer? Uh, do these other worlds, composed of a finite set of atoms, uh, do they actually materialize in any meaningful sense? Or are they still just probabilities? Um, what role does the observer really play? Is the observer present in each collapse in each world of where the wave function appears to be um, you know a solid uh, dimension in and of itself um, because you know for me your analogy between a computer program written essentially in binary ones and zeros uh, and the universe made up of atoms uh, it works uh, on a certain level but what is it that composes atoms? You know, atoms aren't the final uh, layer of reality. There's subatomic particles. Um, we're not quite sure what they really are. They could be vibrating strings. Uh, they could just be mental constructs, um, packets of energy that behave as waves and quanta. We don't really know exactly. Um, but they don't seem to be reducible to the atom. The atom is one um, step along the way. And this is why I, I kind of have a problem with the idea that there's nothing new, that nothing ever is created, nothing develops, nothing changes. Uh, because if, if we look at um, cosmology and, and everything that we can observe today, it, it kind of points in the direction of a Big Bang. Um, not only is the universe expanding, it's expanding faster and faster uh, due to dark energy, whatever that means, um, or negative gravity, uh, which they think is also what sparked the initial inflation of the of the universe. And during this this initial inflation, when the, you know the temperature was uh, gigantically high and uh, energy was not yet formed, uh, there are no atoms. And it took formation, development of energy in, in order for atoms to uh, develop and appear. Uh, and then atoms continued to develop. 
they still exist today, even in this highly complex form, you know, as my organism. Um, but they develop. They, because of gravity, became stars and, and solar systems and planets and chemistry complex enough to give rise to life. Uh, and this isn't just atoms anymore. This has developed into something entirely new. Or at least that's what I'm suggesting. And if we look at the universe purely on a material level and suppose that atoms is all that there really is, we kind of have to assume that the observer is unproblematic. The observer is somehow transcendental. It doesn't interfere with anything that's going on out here. It just measures uh, what's there. It finds reality already solid and, and, and um, existing in and of itself. Uh, when really, I think, to study the stars, we first have to take biology into consideration because that, the scientist is a human being, a human organism with a whole history of evolution. Um, the scientist's perceptual organs evolved. You see, they weren't engineered. Um, we have a very, or uh, probably have a very peculiar way of looking at the world and the pe peculiar way of looking at the world that we happen to have evolved over time may not necessarily give us uh, in any sense an objective view of, of what's out there of what the universe itself is composed of independently of us not that we shouldn't study the stars or you know um, study quarks and subatomic particles but we should always take in, into consideration that the observer is more than just this unproblematic transcendental ego that doesn't interfere with anything that it observes. Um, and so it's almost as though I'm saying instead of looking at the universe as something composed of atoms, dead matter that just reconfigures, reconfigures itself randomly, we kind of have to see it all uh, as an organism, something living something that develops over time is constantly changing and recreating itself based on a past and based on a future uh, goal or motivation. Um, it's, it's a whole shift in, in how we conceive of, of reality, certainly. It's giving reality an inherent purpose, just like organisms. To talk about any organism, you have to use um, a teleological language. When you talk about matter, you don't. Um, but even matter, we know now, has developed. Atoms weren't just there waiting for us to find, uh, or waiting f to develop into life. Atoms had to develop themselves. And so all we have is a history. All we have is this, um, perpetual change. And there's no binary code that makes up everything that the universe, universe is. Uh... Because if you say there is, then you have to explain what came before that, and what came before that. You know, what established the properties of subatomic particles? Well, development, change, evolution. So, um, I know I'm saying something radically uh, different, almost opposite to what you're saying, Simon. Um... But I, I still think that there's a grain of truth in each of these, maybe, and that the real reality is uh, not either or, but, you know, something we can't necessarily put our finger on without neglecting um, something else, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think, and uh, thanks for the clarity of all your videos. It's... Uh, it really makes it a lot easier to uh, to respond and to think about what you're trying to say. So I hope mine was as clear as well. Uh, thanks for listening.